In studio with uh, New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. John, good morning to you. Good morning, sir. Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey Matthew. Good morning. Senate President Craig Blair, who uh, may be governor of the state for a, about a week if uh, the Would dominoes fall. Stop. Huh? You want to please stop? No chance. Stop. Are you kidding me? I got a chance to interview the governor of West Virginia in studio? That doesn't happen every day. I'm not saying anything else. I know you're not. <laughs> and Representative Alex Mooney, who is uh, in studio too. And Alex, pleasant surprise. Great to have yeah. you. Good I could come in person here. Very Great nice. to be with you guys. Uh, props to your publicity department, which would be Lala Mooney, your mom, <laughs> who sent out this yeah. great graphic today that you're going to be on this show. Yeah, I told her. She, if, she's the bomb. She wouldn't want to miss it. I think she watches it every day in her living room. One way or the other. Live on video. It's just her routine. Yeah, that's so. that's great. Lala's wonderful. Your mom's the bomb. She's, uh, she's the best. Uh, first time we've had a chance to talk with you really since the election. It yeah. was going to be a difficult task to yeah. defeat Governor Jim Justice. Yeah. Uh, your thoughts on the vote and the aftermath? Well, no regrets. I did what I thought was right. Gave the voters a choice. Thank the voters in Berkeley County here. I did win Berkeley County and Jefferson and a couple, couple counties in this area, but uh, obviously I didn't have uh, the votes and I called Mr. Justice, congratulated him, uh, so certainly support him in the fall. We need to elect Republicans from president right on down to the U.S. Senate, House of Representatives. Now it's all about the general election. So um, like I say, no regrets. I mean, obviously the Trump endorsement against me uh, held voters for justice that otherwise maybe I could have moved away. And the $10 million or so that was uh, might have come my way didn't come. So, you know, the chips fall where they may, and outside groups didn't get involved like I thought. So, But I have no regrets. I, I, did, I did what I thought was right, and uh, proud of my service here of the 10 years in the House of Representatives. I still have seven more months to do this job. Mm -hmm. A lot of people ask, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? I'm like, you know, this was just a primary. There's still <laughs> a job to be done through actually January 3rd at high noon, the U.S. Constitution which is a wonderful thing. It actually has in the Constitution, United States of America, that Congress uh, ends at, at noon on January 3rd of after the election year. So, like last time, Nancy Pelosi had to step down as Speaker at noon on January 3rd. She got up at 11.59 a.m. and said, thank you for the honor of serving as Speaker of the House in the United States of America. Uh, the House is now adjourned. Mm -hmm. She gaveled it, and she was no longer Speaker of the House, which was a wonderful thing. So, But at noon, I, I'm going to do this job to the best I can all the way through till January 3rd. I have that time to figure out what I want to do next and... You know, I think that uh, that'll be clear by then. I don't, I don't have any plans at the moment. There was a wonderful story and striking about how quick and clear that transition of power is. Alex, it had to do with the Carter transition to Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And the Carter team was working very hard to try to get the hostages released before uh, Inauguration gotcha. Day. Yes. Uh -huh. So there was constant communications. Well, when the transition handed over to Reagan yeah. and Carter's chief of staff, I believe it was, tried to contact... Uh, those yeah. people in power to find out what was going on next, his access to information was immediately cut off because mm. Carter's no longer president, Reagan is. Exactly. And that's how exactly. complete that transition yep. goes, right? Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, your decision to leave Congress to run for Senate, uh, were you frustrated in the United States Congress? Did you feel like you had hit a ceiling? No, I didn't hit a ceiling. I could have stayed for 10 more years. I mean, this is a good Republican district, and I voted. I think I voted the way that my constituents wanted, you know, most of them anyway. Yeah. Not everybody, of course, not the liberals. Um, no, I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think it's very rewarding. Um, it, any job is frustrating. I mean, any of your listeners today have a job. Whatever their job is, I guarantee you they have frustrating parts of their job. Mm -hmm. Lawyer, doctor, engineer, you know, construction worker, whatever. It's frustrating, his job. You know. So certainly it's frustrating, but that's the political process. I mean, we're not dictators here. We have to get a bill through the House, and you got to get a bill through the Senate, and then the president may be a different party, might sign it, might veto it. Sure, the process is frustrating. Um, you know, uh, even within the Republican Party, we have big differences of opinions on not not so much issues but strategy i would say you know what what to fight you know and the spending and stuff so like i stopped voting for these continuing resolutions i know we've talked about it on the show a bunch of times because i don't vote for these trillion dollar spending bills that that give up the power of the purse mm -hmm. like i think the number one thing of, of my position the house of representatives is that power of the purse and you've abdicated it essentially the congress is at house of representatives and so that is frustrating to see my colleagues Republican ones in particular, who say the same things I say when they run for office. I'm going to defend the coal industry. I'm going to defund the EPA that's taken on coal. Oh, we're going to defund the FBI, the witch hunting Trump. Oh, we're going to secure the border. And then they, oh, well, you know, we got to go for these continued resolutions and give Biden all the money. I'm like, whoa, whoa, why did you run for the House of Representatives, which the Constitution gives you that power, and then give it up? I mean, that is, yeah, that's frustrating. That's very frustrating. But, um, you know, they have their, their, 
reasons, what I would call excuses, frankly. Um, and we've I fought that battle for the ten years, and I think my successor Riley Moore will do a good job fighting that battle. So it's not as if my seat was going to go Democrat or something like that. Um, you know, other people can do the job. Most of the seats in Congress are fairly yeah. safe seats now. The, the mismatch in our state was we had a Democrat U.S. Senator named Joe Manchin who voted to convict Donald Trump, who was an innocent man, and, and Joe Manchin voted to remove him from President of the United States of America, which completely does not represent West Virginia. Okay, he did that twice. He tried to throw Trump out of office, who was elected by the people, and falsely charged. And he's still being falsely charged today. It's crazy what they're doing to that man. It is crazy. And I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. We should not use the legal system for political purposes. You should not accuse innocent people. You should not vote to throw somebody out of the President of the United States because he made a phone call to Ukraine to make sure the money's being spent properly. It is crazy what they were doing. Absolutely crazy. So for Mr. Manchin to run around saying, oh, I'm going to be nonpartisan, blah, 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 but then vote to throw Trump out of office, I think that's that's completely uh, hypocritical of him. So when I first ran for the Senate, it was against Joe Manchin. He was the senator then. Okay, He chose to retire rather than lose because whoever won the Republican nomination was going to beat the man. He barely beat Patrick Morrissey six years ago. Our state's like 20% more Republican than six years ago. The man was going to lose. And he voted to impeach and convict Trump. So I knew he was going to lose. So that's what I was running, to fix that problem. You look around the 50 states in the United States of America, and you say, why don't Republicans control the Senate? And the Democrats, when they had control, they literally almost packed the Supreme Court, put two Democrat senators from, from Washington, D.C., did voter harvesting for the whole country to hijack the election system. This was their goal. It's still their goal. And frankly, it's pretty scary. When they have total control, it's pretty scary what they think they would do. So I just, you know, at least one chamber needed to be Republican to stop the completely crazy stuff. Then we could talk about why do we have $34 trillion in debt and why does it keep growing? I mean, since Biden took office, the debt's gone up by 50, 50% from about 24 to $36 trillion. That is crazy numbers. Trillion, trillion. You're talking billions here. We're talking trillions. It is nuts. And we are going towards bankruptcy. And, you know, one of the other reasons, aside from giving up the power of the purse, one of the other reasons I stopped voting for these spending bills is we're bankrupting America. And one day i got to look at my kids and my grandkids and tell them, gee, Dad, you were in Congress for 10 years. Why didn't you stop our country from being bought by China? Why didn't you stop that? Why didn't you stop uh, this careening towards bankruptcy? I don't want to make excuses. And a lot of my colleagues have to make a lot of excuses. Oh, well, the Democrats were going to shut down government and blame us. I didn't want to get falsely blamed for something I'm not doing. You need to stand up to that tactic. That's a political bullying tactic. And they do it every time on every issue. They dare you to vote no. Just yesterday, we voted to build uh, military construction in VA. We actually passed an appropriations bill yesterday with all Republican votes, like we should. We passed it. All the Democrats voted no on it. They voted against VA and military construction. Why? Because we don't do sex change operations anymore in the VA, in that bill. We stopped that. So that's how radical they are. They're happy to vote against a spending bill for veterans and military construction if it doesn't have the woke, leftist, transsexual agenda in there. They vote no. They're not worried about it. They're not worried about being attacked or for being anti-veteran. They attack me and all this stuff. But Republicans get scared. And we got to stop being politically scared. we got to come on shows like yours and explain why we're voting the way we vote. Mr. Gilstrap. I was so excited when the Republicans took back the House because, okay, now the craziness can end. Finally, we'll get somebody with their hand on the tiller. And then you all just started yelling at each other. The internecine fighting between Republicans where just nothing got done. Let's vacate the chair. Let's, and, and nothing got done. <clears throat> and there's a difference between not voting for a continuing resolution. Okay, fine. That, would have, it, 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 it's, that is in itself, it seems to me, a symbolic thing to do and a safe thing to do because ultimately the United States has to pay pay its bills. I get this sense, I feel sometimes like the United States is that ship in Baltimore Harbor that's lost its power and it's just going to go hit something because nobody's, I don't know if it's a matter of courage or imagination or if it's leadership or what is it, but I don't see it, I don't see it changing because, every, let me put it in the form of a question, how does it change? Leaving doesn't do it. Um, we elect people who are more and more entrenched in their own positions, less inclined at the state level as well as at the federal level, less inclined to compromise. So everybody goes to the mattresses and and nothing without compromise. There's no politics and there's no change. How do how do we actually start running the country? Again? <laughs> Well, there was a lot of vague terms there. Nobody's doing this. Compromise. I mean, you got to be a little more specific, frankly. But I, I would say we we can't pass a budget. Yeah. When's the last time you yeah. passed a budget? Well, define budget. I mean, we pass continuing resolutions. That's which not you a budget. Which you just said, yeah, right, exactly. Well, that's what they're doing, and right. it funds everything. 
Right. So they put it all in one big thing, the budget, the spending, all together. Which is an act of cowardice. In a yeah, little... so we agree on that. And, well, I said just yesterday we passed an appropriations bill. We did actually, under Paul Ryan, pass most of our appropriation bills one year. So this is where it gets into the weeds, and all my advisors say people don't follow the details because it's 12 separate, 12 separate spending bills, single-subject spending bills. People seem to get the idea of single-subject. Don't mix military VA with road construction. Don't mix health and human hygiene with the EPA because those are totally separate budget issues. So I think, like, you just got to go back to the way it was intended, I would say. We don't have to build a new mousetrap here. We don't have to reinvent a whole new system. We have a system that if you follow it, I think that's where it all occurs. And you talk we about can the, do that. Yeah, we can absolutely we can do that. Who? We, we I did. mean, who is that a congressional thing? Is that the House, the the uh, Speaker of the House can do that? Just say, okay, this is what we're going to do, well, folks. So it's a democracy. You need a majority vote. Okay. You need 218 people. Right. There's 435 members of Congress. Right. 218 is the majority. Right. That's who. Well, I know. That's but, who. The Speaker of the House isn't a dictator. He doesn't get to do it by himself. You need a majority of people elected by the, you know that. I do know that. But who, but this isn't how we split out these things. What you're describing in terms of, of actually, when it comes to the budgeting process, we are, we, we do bundle all of these together. And because the, the um, we, we package different programs together so that if, if you don't vote for my thing, I don't vote for your thing. Right, so is that making sense? The problem that you just you, that you just stated, the the solution you just stated. Who's in charge of doing that? Who's in charge of making that happen? Two hundred eighteen people. The majority of the people elected constitutionally in this country is in charge of that. So I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand what you're who, asking here. Somebody's got to lead them. It's like herding cats. I mean, what do you, who, well, who I is actually? That. I agree with that. Getting two hundred eighteen people on the same page could be hard, especially if you only have a five seat majority. You know, normally the parties will get in line. Like Pelosi did a great job of that, to be honest with you. I don't agree with her positions, mm -hmm. but she was able to get the Democrats pretty much to vote lockstep for all their left wing stuff. I mean, there's a few people would peel off, and not always. Like the transportation bill, the $1.3 trillion non infrastructure bill that I attacked McKinley for voting for. In that particular case, 13 Republicans voted to put it over the top, and six Democrats would not vote for it, actually. And those were the squad members that wouldn't vote for it. So she isn't perfect in this either. Right. People like to say, oh, Republican, Republican. She couldn't get it through. Like it, six months went by, she could not pass her transportation bill. She failed at doing that. The 13 Republicans gave her that bill. So you want compromise, there you go. But then you get $250 billion more of debt. Is that the compromise you want? $250 billion more of debt was in that bill. That's why we have $34 trillion. So you can say compromise, but I don't think that was a good compromise. I think the idea would be balance the budget. And this is something people should agree on. This, is, this shouldn't even be an argument. Republican Bill Clinton was for a balanced budget. He was all for it. Almost passed a balanced budget amendment. And there would be compromise there because some Democrats did support a balanced budget amendment. And here's the last the president to balance a budget. He would. It he actually happened. Yeah. It actually happened because you say, how do we do it? I think in, in 20 years ago, <laughs> it was 20 years ago, Kasich was, was chairman, chairman of the Budget Committee, worked with Bill Clinton. We passed two years of a balanced budget. We should have passed the amendment, though, because since then, look, people want a result. Okay, people want a result. Okay, and the Democrats, they want this money and they want to spend it in certain ways. And if ramming it through in a debt-ridden continuing resolution, which they've been doing for like the 10 years I've been there, gets them what they want, that's what they're going to do. Okay, what is the compromise in that? If they can get everything they want, why would they compromise? Why so, compromise? You can get everything you want. Just take everything you want. So you, you say compromise, but like, so you, we you know, that would take both people. Okay. No, Matt, I, Matt Harvey, go ahead. <laughs> Congressman, so if there was a balanced budget today, what would that mean? There's obviously people that are against that because they're profiting from it, I'm assuming. So would there have to be some significant cuts yeah, to government services? Yeah, serious cuts. We'd have to do what Craig was describing, you know, priority-based budgeting. Start with what you absolutely have to do, and you get to the end. You can't do it. You can't do it all. Everybody but, can't have everything. But, but then want. your surplus is already automatically committed to paying back this thirty-four yeah. day, yeah, thirty-four yeah. trillion dollars trillion. in debt, and a yeah. trillions a thousand. Yeah. You're billions. talking like eight hundred billion a year, more than the military, United States of America. That's what we've created for ourselves: a credit card debt of about eight hundred billion per year. The Two largest. million a minute, according yeah. to the Wall Street Journal. Is it, is it just? And is it a problem? It's just too big I, to I even address. I hate to address? say that. This is what the compromise is getting you. Is that really what you want in compromise? That is giving up the principles. That this would be my opinion. Like hmm? the compromise you come through, and in all these bills, all these resolutions and things, and and they end up putting it into the debt. See, what both parties can agree on is more spending. It's you say, oh, you want this? I'll give you money for that. I want money for this. Let's all spend all this money and just borrow it. 
grandkids will pay it off one day. It's just not right. It's not right. The compromises aren't always the right solution per se. We want to compromise. Like, like what I've experienced, the Democrats, I think, are just tougher at negotiating than a lot of Republicans is what is what I've experienced in my 10 years. And they'll give they'll, uh, the compromises, we'll give, we'll give them like 95% of what they want, even when we're in charge, because the Democrats in the Senate will just won't pass anything. And you saw that with the, with, the, with the latest debt ceiling deal. We actually passed a bill with all Republican votes. There was no compromise. Not one Democrat voted for it. We passed a bill earlier this year when Kevin McCarthy was still Speaker. I think he did a good job on this, by the way. The first debt ceiling bill he passed. It had all sorts of cuts to the budget, put us on a balanced budget path. It's things that Republicans promised to do. That's the other part of it. Like When you run for office, you promise to do certain things. And I have a view that when you promise to do something and you get elected, you should actually do it. How's that? I mean, don't get in there and say, I'm going, to balance, I'm going to balance the budget and then make excuses for 10 years while you never balance the budget. I mean, I said I'd vote pro-Second Amendment. I voted pro-Second Amendment the whole time. The frustration, I think voters have, the frustration I think voters have, particularly Republican voters, is Republicans get in office and then they don't do what they said they would do. They don't, they don't defend the coal industry, which is under, constantly under attack by the administration. It's constantly. Even Biden just did a power plant rule a few weeks ago. That everything's got to be carbon neutral in eight years. It's not possible. It's going to destroy coal. We've got to stop that. How you stop it? You take you take the money away from the EPA. That's how you stop it. Stop you know these tracks. you know these people on in the aggregate. Why do they do that? Why do they walk away? Well, so they're they're at the end of the day, the tactic is a government shutdown will occur, and then who gets blamed for a government shutdown? So if you believe the presumption that Republicans will always get blamed if the government shutdown occurs on discretionary spending, now to make it clear, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, those are mandatory programs. They continue no matter what. We can fight over our budget, not pass a budget, not pass the spending bills. So military won't get paid. Troops won't get paid. Uh, we won't fund the roads. But the mandatory programs continue no matter what. That's the government shutdown scenario. And that's, that's, always, what's, that's always a cloud hanging over our heads. You know? And the Democrats are pretty good at blaming Republicans for that. And too many Republicans won't come on shows like this, frankly, and explain the truth. And, you, you know, the mainstream media, frankly, which I think is pretty much run by Democrats and liberal biased, they're immediately going to say Republicans are shutting down government, even though it's the Senate not passing a bill by Democrats in the Senate not passing a bill. I mean, Marco Rubio said this. I'm going to pick somebody who's not as radioactive. Marco Rubio said this in one of his uh, years ago. He said, uh, when there's a government shutdown and Republicans are in control, Republicans get blamed. And when there's a government shutdown and Democrats are in control, Republicans get blamed. And he said, this hypocrisy can't continue. And that, that is the whole thing. So we'll pass, like the military bill we passed yesterday. Great bill. No, it shouldn't even be controversial. It just doesn't do sex change operations. So, I mean, and this will happen with Ro roads is not controversial. Will that, will that bill just get, will it go anywhere it go, in the Senate? It goes to the Senate now. And the Senate should take it up. If, if This is even where both parties have to, the Senate is Democrat controlled. They'll take it up. I guess they can put other things in there, not just the sex change operations, which, which shouldn't be taxpayer funded, obviously. But there's other things they'll disagree upon, too. And this was all said yesterday on the House floor. They can pass it, change it. You go to conference committee, and there's where the give and take is in a conference committee between both chambers of government. This is all taught in fifth grade. I mean, we don't have to reinvent anything. We ought to just do it the way it was designed to do. It's worked for hundreds of years. It just hasn't been done really just last 20 years. This is new history we're talking about. Let I'll me jump in here because I promised Craig Blair could no. interview Alex Mooney before we were oh, done okay. today. Craig, right. you got a question for Alex. Go. Well, I've got two questions. Uh -oh. First of all, fifth grade, where'd you go to school at? <laughs> I went to St. John's Catholic <laughs> Regional School. Okay, good school. <laughs> well, they uh, teach you in West Virginia. They teach, it. They teach course, government in fifth did, grade, don't they? It was not taught to that extent. Uh, trust me. But our people how do, it becomes a lot. The average person out here has no idea about how the legislature operates or... or Congress, uh, they're they're counting on you or me to be able to do the job, and yeah. then goes. But I want to switch gears just a little bit. Talk about the transition. Are you tell us what you're doing with Raleigh Moore right now, preparing to yeah. go to, to the transition? Because I, that's a good behind the scenes. And I got message. two and a half minutes for the answer, oh. Alex. Go. Well, I endorse Raleigh. Raleigh endorsed me. We're good friends. Technically, he still has to win in November. I think we all know he's probably going to win in November, but yeah, so let's I'm, just check, I'm let's check that box. Yeah, I, I am too. So, no, we've, we've traded some messages. On, I have a couple of district offices. He can decide whether to keep those or not, staff, things like that. I think it'll be a smooth transition. I'm going to do everything I can to help him. How about in D.C.? 
Same. Well, DC won't keep my office, but I mean, there's there's, email, there's no, lists. No, I get that, but to, to, to oh. picking up on you, to, to, there's a lots yeah. more to your job than just being an, uh, a legislator, so to speak. You 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 have all these other issues. For instance, somebody can't get their passport. Yeah, oh, that's uh, yeah. and there's this whole machinery mechanism yeah. that's behind the scenes that you to, if you're able to transfer your knowledge to, yeah. to him, and, yeah. and Riley already has some. Yeah. Of, but uh, that's what I was fishing for. Yeah. No. In DC, the big thing is I have lists of people who have contacted my office over the years on issues. So giving them the, the list of contact information, continuing the casework that we're, we're ongoing. We do a great job of casework. Anyway, so up until January 3rd, I'm still the guy you call for if you have a passport issue or something like that. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I get that. Yeah. Uh, for, trust me, yeah, I'm, I'm still the Senate president until you know, January the yeah. 7th or yeah. something like that. I forget the date. <laughs> I'm just trying to give quick answers because you said we had two minutes left. Yeah, got about two minutes left. And uh, now it's down to about one. So, Alex, here's, here's the last question. And after... January rolls around and the transition yeah. takes place. What do you do next? Are you going to be on television as a as an expert <laughs> commentator somewhere, or are you going to be uh, doing something else? Uh, Tell me what has I don't know. I, you know, I had a small business development. <laughs> you don't want to wake up that early. <laughs> <laughs> I really haven't decided yet, to be honest. But I had a small business development consulting business for a couple of years before mm -hmm. I came to Congress. I could go back to that. That was actually a pretty uh, enjoyable time. I had a lot of free time for my family. It's one of the reasons I have a nine-year-old child. Mine are 20 and 18, and then nine years later, when I had a lot of free time, I was around the house a lot, and now we have a nine-year-old child as well. So <laughs> we can it, connect the God, dots. God, that, yeah. God, God bless me. God bless me with another baby. Last time I lost an election, but I will. I will say I'm 17 and two in elections, so I still think my record's pretty That's good. That's correct. Yeah, uh, I would give you a, a you know during the commercials that uh, Governor Justice, I'm not sure if it was his or his PAC. I, I guess it was the PAC ran. They called you Marilyn Mooney. Ah. I'm going to change your name to Machine Gun Mooney. That's some of the fastest delivery we've ever had oh, on really? this show that you just well, did in the last like half hour. Here live, it's easier. So. Fast talker, good, yeah. uh, good stuff. Please say hello to your mom for oh, us. Well, thank you. Right, and tell her thanks for everything, and thank you for your accessibility while you were in Congress. And we look forward to talking to you again before you leave the office sure, there. Sure, uh, and Senator Blair, thank you as well, sir.